Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another MedSynapse podcast, your go-to source for medical insights and medical discussions. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and today we have a very special episode focused on polycystic ovary syndrome, where we will be talking on its long-term health implications and screening methods. Joining us all the way from UAE is our esteemed guest, Dr. Anita Dilip, a distinguished obstetrics and gynecology specialist with over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Dr. Anita. Thank you so much once again. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be here and I'm very thankful to again the Dr. Nika and the Medicine FC. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita, for having us on this important topic. Today, we will be delving into the long-term health concerns associated with PCOS and how to effectively screen for them, particularly in light of the rising prevalence of PCOS in the Middle East region. Dr. Anita, let's start by addressing the main long-term health concerns for PCOS patients beyond fertility issues. Now, what are they and why are they important? Yes, thank you so much for asking the very interesting question. As I already mentioned in our first session that polycystic ovarian syndrome is not only the present complaint, but it has a, a grave consequences in later life, in future life. So it is very important to screen the polycystic ovarian syndrome women for the, these long-term implications that includes the metabolic syndrome, which includes the dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and the cardiovascular diseases, sleep apnea, which is increased 30-fold uh, increase in the women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, daytime somnolence, and uh, in the last but not the least, the endometrial pathology, which ranges from the endometrial hyperplasia and the endometrial cancer. It is very clear that PCOS has far-reaching implications for health beyond just reproductive concerns. Now, given these risks, how often should PCOS patients be screened for cardiovascular health risks? And also, what are the recommended screening protocols for metabolic health? Yeah, it is a, a, another interesting question because there is no fixed uh, protocol for the screening the women with the polycystic ovarian syndrome for the uh, long-term health implication. There is an individualized risk assessment tool for every woman depending upon their own risk factor. So uh, in every medical field, in every condition, the screening is started from the history in order to assess whether there are the risk factors for that condition. And next step is to assess whether there are the symptoms and severity. And after that, there are the lab investigations. And then we have to make individualized plan for each individual depending upon those risk factors. So these are the, in terms of the, uh, like in history, if we are asking for the risk factor, like the obesity, like the uh, uh, level of their physical activity in terms of the exercise, like uh, presence are um, uh, in, 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 ter in terms of the smoking habit, how do uh, they perform in their daily life? So we can assess on the basis of their risk, uh, risk factor their symptoms and their lab investigations. So there is a no fixed protocols. We have to make individual strategies for every woman depending upon their history. So if we are coming to the cardiovascular risk assessment, are the metabolic syndrome uh, for the screening purpose, we have to ask for the smoking, we have to ask for their lifestyle in terms of the eating habit, in terms of the level of their physical activity, whether there is a presence of the family history of the type 2 diabetes or there is a personal history of the type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia or the hypertension. After that, we have to uh, do the examination where we have to uh, check for her, their uh, body mass index. But more particular in case of the women with polycystic ovarian syndrome is the waist hip ratio. We have to check at each visit for these things and also ask for the smoking. And uh, apart from that, we have to check for the hypertension, but pre how frequent we will do the checking for the hypertension again depends upon their body mass index. If their body mass index is less than 25, then uh, annually we need to check their blood pressure. If it is equal or more than 25, then at each visit we need to check for the blood pressure. Regarding the type 2 diabetes mellitus screening, again it depends upon their BMI and the presence or absence of other 
risk factor for the type 2 diabetes. So if their BMI is less than 25, there are no other risk factor. Every two years, they need to do the oral glucose tolerance test for the screening for type 2 diabetes mellitus. And for the dyslipidemias, again, if, if their BMI is less than 25, two yearly lipid pro profile. Otherwise, if their BMI is 20, more than 25 or 25 or other risk factor for the cardiovascular diseases or the metabolic syndrome, then these women need annual oral glucose tolerance test and the lipid profile. Now, as we know, endometrial cancer risk is another significant concern for PCOS patients. Now, how should the how should the patients be monitored for this risk and what red flags should doctors watch for? Yeah, this is a, a very interesting question, uh, Dr. Nigar. Because of the, you know, in the polycystic ovarian syndrome, what happened because of the oligominoria or aminoria, there is an increased risk of the endometrial hyperplasia and the endometrial cancer. So women may present with the irregular bleeding or may uh, present with the frequent bleeding or aminoria. We have to counsel the, this is a very important point uh, in the counseling for the patient with the polycystic ovarian syndrome that it is not necessary to have the every month the red the red signal we have to see if the women is with the polycystic ovarian syndrome is getting the every three months at least every three months periods without any medication it is okay for them because we have to give them withdrawal bleed at least every three months in order to prevent the endometrial pathology that could be the endometrial hyperplasia or endometrial cancer so what we have to counsel the women if they are not having their periods even for the three months or four months, we need to do the transvaginal ultrasound where we have to look for the endometrial thickness. In the women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, the cutoff for thickness is more than 7 mm. And if it is more than 7 mm, patient is having the irregular bleeding, patient is known case of the polycystic ovarian syndrome, then we have to go for the endometrial sampling by either by the PEPEL as an outpatient uh, procedure or by the under the hysteroscopic guidance. So, there is no fixed rule that how frequent we can go for the transvaginal scan or how frequent we will go for the endometrial sampling because it depends upon the patient's symptomatology. If patient is asymptomatic, no need to go for the annual checking for the transvaginal scan or the uh, endometrial sampling. So this is very important to counsel the women if they are not having the period, even after three or four months, they should consult their healthcare professional in order to have a withdrawal bleed which we can do uh, with the uh, progesterone withdrawal bleed and if it is it's still not positive we have uh, uh, to go for the transvaginal scan and the endometrial sampling if needed thank you so much dr anita for making it clear to us and to our audience okay. now moving on mental health is often neglected but is also a critical aspect of pcos care what mental health screenings should be routinely conducted for PCOS patients and how can we support their mental well-being? Yeah, this is a very, very big dilemma, in, not only in the polycystic ovarian syndrome, but also in the um, every medical condition. The, I, uh, the women feel very shy. They try to hide their mental health issues uh, and they, they're uh, very... Uh, avoiding to contact with the healthcare professional regarding their mental health issues because in case of the polycystic ovaries there are the multiple reasons that patient, women may go in the depression anxiety or eating disorder so we have to screen those women at each consultation appointment there are the reasons like there is a uh, depression because of their own physical appearance due to the obesity due to the hirsutism not only because of this because of the infertility issues reproductive issues and also because of the fear of the long-term health implication, they they may have the depression, they may have the anxiety and eating disorder, but they are hiding these things from, because they, they may not realize that how important, how great these consequences in future. So at each consultant consultation, we have to screen the women for the mental health issues. And again, I must say that the starting point is a history. In order to evaluate any risk factor for developing mental health issues, any symptoms and any severity in um, uh, of those symptoms that is going to affect their daily routine life there are the many questionnaires we are using in our clinical practice including the patient health questionnaire nine for the depression generalized anxiety disorder 
um, get seven for the anxiety and the eating attitude test which is the eat 26 to evaluate for the eating behavior apart from that we can uh, conduct the structured or semi-structured inter interviews in order to evaluate the risk factors as well as for the symptoms and uh, how these symptoms are going to affect their daily routine life in uh, because these uh, these mental health issues are very important if i cannot assess myself the level and severity of mental health issues i can take the multidisciplinary team involvement including the psychiatrist clinical psychologist as well as the counselor who are the very right person in order to counsel how to move on with having this condition so on the basis of the results of these screening tests we can uh, plan the individualized preventive as a, as well as management strategies for women having with the polycystic ovarian syndrome so this is a very important a very first consultation we have to screen them for the mental health issues in order to uh, make the early diagnosis and early intervention thereby we can prevent the grave consequences of the late diagnosis which may may uh, be the cases of the suicide and the uh, harm to other people thank you so much dr anita for touching on this very sensitive aspect and taking care of our pcos patients definitely neglecting mental health um, considerations can uh, lower the overall patient care and quality of life to the patients Therefore, it is very okay. crucial to prioritize the comprehensive support, the routine screenings, and provide access to mental health resources for the PCOS patients. Now, moving on to our final question of the day, let's touch on bone health in PCOS patients. What are the standard protocols for assessing and managing the bone health in this population? Yeah, because uh, there is uh, many studies have been done so far, Dr. Nega, that there is an association of the vitamin D deficiencies in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which, which is going to affect their bone health. And apart from that, uh, the hormonal imbalances and the lack of regular activities, the smoking, obesity, presence of the uh, family history of the fractures, the personal history of the fractures, we have to again the uh, counsel and screen each woman at consult initial consultation for these bone health issues. In, by asking the uh, history regarding the risk factor, regarding the symptoms. Apart from that, there are the various tools to assess the uh, bone mineral density. And out of those, the, there is a one DEXA that is a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. That is a gold standard to see the bone mineral density. Apart from that, we can check the blood levels for the vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, and there are the other tools to assess the fracture risk assessment which uh, one of those tools is a press which we can we are using to assess the 10 year probability of the fracture and apart from that we have to examine the women for the bone abnormalities or the bone fragilities and on the basis of the results of these screening we can start the lifestyle modification in terms of the healthy eating and the regular exercises with the involvement of the physiotherapist, with the involvement of the dietitian, because the, I already mentioned that PCOS is not a single etiology, not a single uh, symptom, not a single healthcare profession can uh, treat the women with a polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is the, uh, the, the condition which needs the input from the multidisciplinary team, uh, which involves the physiotherapists, dietitians, counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, endocrinologists, and gynecologists. So the results of the, these screening tests will guide us that what is the indi individualized protocol for this women having this problem, which ranges from the li healthy lifestyle, diet, regular exercises, medicines, which may be the hormonal medications or the disease-modifying medications, depending upon everyone's individual needs and also the calcium supplement, vitamin D supplement. So it is a very important because if we are not looking at these conditions, the women with PCOS are more concerned about their periods, about their fertility issues. Only these men uh, symptoms we are uh, facing in the day-to-day -day clinical practice, but they are least bothered about their mental health issues, about their bone health. So. The counseling is very important at very first consultation that 
uh, we can understand the current issue is the fertility issues current issue is the menstrual issues but we have to take care of you because of the long term health implications and because their health is our priority to make their uh, quality of life to make their uh, the uh, decrease risk and increase the life expectancy in the future Thank you so much, Dr. Anita, for sharing your expertise with us today and for contributing on this very important topic. You have definitely um, enriched our discussion on this important topic of PCOS and on its long-term health implications. Um, I'm sure that our listeners have gained knowledge and better understanding on this topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nega. I would like to add only one uh, question from my own side. Because we discuss almost all the things, including the metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular, bone health, mental health issues, as well as the endometrial pathologies. But there is another important uh, and the long term health consequences, which includes the sleep apnea. There is a 30 fold increased risk of sleep apnea in women with the, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we have to ask for, for those symptoms and the continuous airway, positive pressure, ventilation as a treatment regimen is going to have these women with a complaint of a sleep apnea. So this is one of the very, very important uh, uh, long-term consequences in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. I would like to say thank you to you and your team for giving me this opportunity because polycystic ovary syndrome is near to my heart and I am trying out my best that whatever I, I know, I, I just want to share with the audience, with my colleagues, and I, I, I just try of my best to provide the best care to my patient, especially in terms of the counseling, because there are very uh, uh, mis uh, misconceptions related to that. And I would like to add one more important uh, thing that there is no relation between the polycystic ovarian syndrome and ovarian cancer or the breast cancer. Only cancer related to the polycystic ovarian syndrome is the endometrial cancer, not uh, other cancer. Thank you so much once again. I, I, I think I, we should extend our session related to the polycystic ovarian syndrome in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anita, for highlighting on the correlation between PCOS and sleep apnea. This definitely highlights the interplay between the endocrine and the respiratory systems. I believe that collaboration between endocrinologists and sleep specialists is very essential for optimizing the therapeutic strategies and enhancing patient care in these complex clinical scenarios. Thank you so much once again, doctor. And to our esteemed audience, if you have any questions or topics you would like us to cover in the future episodes, please do not hesitate to comment below. Your feedback is very valuable in shaping the content of our podcast and ensuring that we address the most pressing concerns in the field of medicine. Thank you once again for joining us. Until next time, stay informed and continue striving for excellence in patient care. Goodbye and until next time. Thank you.